Welcome to uh, Lost Boys Podcast, episode one. My name is Odre. To the left of me, I got Bailey B. Smith. To the right of me, I got Rose, Killer Phil, Miles. Give a fuck, but if you love me. the guest on the podcast today. And uh, to the far left, we got Baby Preem. Let's go. Yeah. So uh, starting off here, we got this new location here in Kirkland. What a blessing. Uh, the Rainier building got closed down. Um, but coming t- back. Coming back. Coming back. Temporary construction. So what, 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 is the, what is the news on that? What is the update and what is even happening? <laughs> Hell of a year, to say the least. Uh, long story short, the EPA came in, had to shut down the building for some major renovations that ended up taking way longer than any of us expected. But we finally got some good news start of December that they were going to be reopening end of December, which clearly didn't happen as expected, because if anyone knows the government, they take twice as long with anything. But we got to be getting close, so I'm really hoping by end of January, early February, and then we will be able to be running two locations, which will be freeing up a lot of the schedule, which is needed right now. Yeah. Yeah. So what? What is it? Just like a a paint project? I I drove by and I see they got like the big white tin up. Like yeah. Or is it a <clears throat> is it like a full scale remodel or? To me, it's just a paint project, but I'm also not involved in that industry whatsoever, so I don't really understand the details. But what I'm told is they were doing, I guess, pollution tests down on the water, and they found lead, which traced back to the old paint that was on the building. Because I guess from the 50s and 60s, they used to put lead in the paint. And anytime a windstorm or anything would come, it'd slowly be chipping away the paint, end up in the drainage system, and then wash down in the water. I mean, because so that building is how old? 18, how old is that 1875? building? 1875? Something yeah. like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, yeah. yeah, we're going on like a buck fifty easily. Yeah. But it's historical. So, I know it's a process not only to do all the renovations, but they also have to do it in a proper way to where it keeps its historical value, you know? Because yep. that's got to be one of the first, like, real buildings in Seattle that's still standing, you know. Plus Rainier Beer. I mean, that shit's iconic. It's so it's so crazy. Like, look, uh, driving on I-5, like, that's the, the – everybody knows the R, mm-hmm. you know. Like, it's it's iconic just by that, even if you don't even know yeah. the history of the Do you, any of you guys remember when it had the T on top when Tolly's owned it? Oh. I it was short-lived, like, eight like- years. It was a while ago, though. It was like mid two thousands. I want to say like two thousand four or something. Tolly's bought it, super temporary, and they had their headquarters (laughs) there. And they brought down the R and put up a T, and they got so much backlash that they ended up putting the R back on. (laughs) Like no one wants to see a Tolly's T. I have to censor that out, but yeah. fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fuck you, yeah. But yeah, that was like what a- a- April twenty three or May. 20- Did it close? Well, yeah. we got the May notice 20th. in February, and originally they were only gonna give us thirty days, but we kept pushing them because obviously we had to find a second location to keep running because business doesn't stop, music doesn't stop. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so we were able to get a little bit of leeway and we ended up getting, I think like a 60 day notice and we officially were out by like May 1st, something like that. We were doing sessions until the 20th, but we had started. Okay. So packing stuff out. (laughs) We had started packing stuff out like way before. Yeah. Yeah. As far as amps, guitars. And slowing down and gear. Yeah. Yeah. But thanks to the amazing gentleman at Every Flow, you guys made this happen this beautiful spot which is unbelievable and really saved us when we were in a pickle that was really unfortunate because there's a lot of businesses in there that we're really close with that got completely fucked over not going to name any companies or anything because that's their personal business but i mean i know a couple people personally that had to take out personal loans just to be able to pay their mortgages and put food on the table for a year and yeah i don't know how that shit's even legal I mean, I know nothing about the details of commercial properties and all that, but I just know that we were blessed to be able to pick up, you know, three months later in July at this location where, unfortunately, a lot of other companies are still unable to work. Still and, struggling or looking yeah, for something. So and at the end of the creatives. day, it was a shitty situation, but we're counting our blessings. Yeah. 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 
pretty 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 awesome opportunity for us at Ivy Flow as well. Um, uh, being able to, to to give to the community and create a pathway, you know, so so everyone can kind of get back to work, but not not just to work to, uh, through through music. What you guys do uh, gives gives the community a voice, you know, somewhere that they can come and be creative and uh, and do their their work and arts and uh, be able to to distribute that and it touch a lot of ears. So like it's it it was a it, it was a blessing, pretty great opportunity to to find this space and yeah. be able to to come in and collaborate and build the space out and like get the wheels back rolling because you know like like i get like you're saying like i get it you know you you have you have multiple engineers under you um few now right um and uh got to keep keep the bills paid food on the table so some something something yeah. like this was was needed for well sure. even beyond that what i really noticed and for the first time in like my 10 to 15 year career that really hit me was that three to four month gap of really starting to move everything out of Seattle and then getting this spot opened was the amount of people that would hit me needing sessions, not just for the sake of getting material material out, but it's their therapy, you know, without having yeah. this creative yeah. space and being able to vent whatever the hell's going on in their life. Like we had artists that we're really close with that were going crazy, you know? Yeah. And I mean, yeah. And 2023, 2024, we have the luxury of being able to do some things at home on our laptop and whatnot, but it's just a different energy and experience whenever you're able to get in a safe place with an engineer that you trust and have that bond with over years, you know, it's kind of like working with a therapist, you know? Yeah. So 100%. that really hit yeah. me heavy for those Seriously. like four months. I, it gave me a whole different angle on what we do as engineers and producers or studio owners or so true. Yeah. Else, or just, you know? yep. just what music is about in general. Right. Like, I mean, as much as, you know, in today's era, music is pushed as like, like a career opportunity, yeah. you know, and, and the, uh, the creative element and therapeutic element gets lost. Right. Yeah. Um, Why we started this in the first place. Exactly. <laughs> precisely. Right. I was even having this conversation with Dre a few days ago just about like, you know, why like music, like why music started initially. Right. It It is for that creative release, you know, because uh, it kind of started with poetry in a way. Right. Yeah, and spoken poetry. Word. Exactly. And things yeah. like spoken word, like it's to communicate something that, you know, you you've been kind of harboring within yourself. Yeah. Um, you know, it wasn't always driven about yeah. notoriety. You know, music isn't founded upon the idea that you make it to to become famous. Right. Yeah. Um, I remember that was the last thing on their mind. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Literally. I remember before Dre and I had even, you know, met in person for the first time. I was ready to hang it up. I was ready to quit making music in I general. Tell me that story. Yeah, because yeah. I wanted so badly to be you know recognized or or respected for the craft or something like that right um but when when he reached out what kept me coming was that therapeutic nature of it right was like i was i was still writing music and and i needed to to get it out right and so him you know uh opening opening his doors you opening your doors right um to a space to give me that opportunity to release things that had been weighing on me for years right um was truly like like kind of like one of the one of the things that i'm most grateful for um so i'm glad that you touched on that point because it kind of gave you a new spark just in yeah every creative avenue not just music but with your fashion and everything else certainly certainly yeah, that's yeah. dope because i mean they all coexist within that culture you know Sur yeah for sure yeah yeah let's feel inspired yeah shoot because like, it, it fires me up too because like that's that like that's what we're doing um you know, I, I remember there was a time where I hadn't even been in a studio with like a booth and stood behind <laughs> the mic, you know, and yeah. like w when you get to that point, something like that is so impactful beyond like a measurable word because it was like a dream at one point and then, then you get there. So the amount of confidence that you were able to like yield and take and carry with you through like your everyday life is 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 it's real you know and then like when it's gone like it's like something that it could be it 
it could be a little bit part of your soul yeah. stripped away. Yeah. 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 Well, and, these, and, these, yeah. <laughs> and these artists, like a lot of artists, dedicate their lives to telling their story. Mm-hmm. You know, like telling telling their story, what they've been through, and it it's super super. It's so much like therapy that it it becomes like addictive in in that way of just and like you're saying like especially just being on the mic like you know you f- you get that power that power of like you know speech yeah. you know so especially this generation sick. we're like the first generation where being a little more vulnerable is accepted as men if that makes any sense for sure I mean if you look at our parents or grandparents generation like it was almost looked down for men to go see therapists or anything like that. So, you know, spoken word or music was kind of their only way of venting, you know? I mean, things have gone a long ways and are a lot better now, but for a long while there, that's all we really had, you know? Yeah, yeah it's very important. Uh, I mean, you know, we really did want to bring you on as our first guest to, to be able to, to, you know, not only for us to learn more about you, but to give the people the opportunity to learn more about you as well, right? I think Lost Boys, just in general, has like this this mysterious like aura around it, you know? You don't advertise, you're not running ads like, hey, everybody, come over here, right? But you're still able to, you know, offer offer an opportunity for the people to come and record. But I think it would be great for them to learn more about you, like what what got you into engineering tell us more about like your background and how lost boys came into fruition all of that yeah I'm absolutely intrigued. so first of all lost boys is a reference to peter pan and the lost boys and that comes from one if you knew me at all from probably the age i want to say four years old to eight or nine i literally had a peter pan costume that i wore fucking daily like i was obsessed with that movie <laughs> And uh, so, yeah, that always stuck with me of as far as like finding a career that is not just a cubicle nine to five to where you're working your ass off and there's no real purpose behind it besides, you know, feeding some Fortune 500 company or something, you know, Um, because money comes and goes. But once you retire and you have X amount of money in the bank, do you really feel fulfilled and like you did something with your life, you know? Um, so going back, my dad was hands down the greatest influence on me when it came to music. Um, he was a huge vinyl nerd. He played around a little bit with engineering and producing, I want to say like mid seventies, late seventies into the early eighties. And then he met my mom and my mom got pregnant with my sister. And at that time, Unfortunately, you know, music didn't have the, I guess, the middle ground that we're blessed with now. Like, you literally made no money or you were at record labels, you know, where nowadays we're blessed with streaming services and everything else to where if you're smart enough, you don't need to be on a label to be able to pay your bills and shit. Um, Fast forward, I want to say 10, 15 years to when I was born. And from day one, I always remember, and it's so cliche, but all styles and genres of music are always played in the house. My Both my parents were huge blues and jazz fans, um, so my government name is Miles, and that's named after Miles Davis. Oh, that's so cool. Miles Davis. I didn't know that. Yeah, so Miles Davis, Miles Davis, hands down, was probably played the most in my house, but I mean, it went all across the board from Frank Sinatra to Bob Marley to Rolling Stones, um, Peter Green, you name it. And I also remember my dad still had all of his old uh, tape recorders. You know, it wasn't anything crazy serious that you're going to find at these major studios. You know, there were maybe like four to six track tape machines, but we would just fuck around with those for hours. You know, I had this old shitty like ukulele that my sister brought back from Hawaii and we would just, and this shows how old it was is there wasn't even XLR cables. They were still using quarter inch. Mm -hmm. So you'd have Mm -hmm. these like sure microphones that have a quarter inch input. They'll go straight into the tape machines and we would just play around with that. You know, that's yeah, that's all I really knew from like, I want to say, I want to say six to like 11 or 12. And then when everything changed, um, the first band, I want to say this like 98 or 99, that got me into like 
actually having a passion for music was this band uh do you remember smash mouth mm-hmm. they oh, had yeah, a yeah. huge yeah. song on i think it was like the shrek soundtrack yeah, or something yeah, yeah all-star. all-star yeah, yeah exactly yeah. Wow. and so they had this huge That's song crazy. coming out and uh i went down to our like local record store this was before itunes and shit like you know early 2000s or late 90s maybe and i put in a pre-order for the cd and cd yeah cd yeah. physical yeah. cds yeah. all right yeah. And uh, like two weeks later, I go to pick it up because all back then all albums were dropped on Tuesdays. I have no idea why, but Tuesday <clears> was the day. <throat> Movies were on Fridays and music was on Tuesdays. And so my dad drives me down there. I go to pick it up and they hand me the wrong CD. And I'm like, this isn't what I pre-ordered. Like, what is this? And I don't know. I was probably like, I want to say 12 or 13, something like that. And it's got like a half naked girl on it. Like with breasty okay we'll say that and my dad was like i don't know what this is but like the owner of the record store is like a mom paw store you know like she was like okay i'll get the right one for you but just take a listen to this i think you might like it and ends up being blink 182 which was their huge album in 1999 enema of the state and if you remember that it had a i think an ex-porn star that was dressed up as a nurse or something like that and for the first time, like that album showed me a blend between three different elements. It was one, the angst of being a teenager. Like whenever you're at that age, you hate authority, you hate school, you hate your teachers. You just want to skateboard and experiment with anything, whether it's girls or Defiant. weed or alcohol. It doesn't yeah. matter. You know, just you just life. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. You want to go yep. against like the norm, you know. And at the time, I didn't realize this, but <clears throat> one of the I don't want to say the biggest producers, but one of the most detail focused producers had a major play on that album. And his name was Jerry Finn. And if you listen to any pop punk album after that, they all try to imitate what Jerry Finn did on that album. Mm. And I didn't know it at the time because I knew nothing about producing or engineering or music, but there was a reason that my ear was attracted to that album. And fast forward, once I got into engineering and started looking into producers, and I see this name pop up over and over, Jerry Finn, Jerry Finn, Jerry Finn. And I'm like, okay, who the hell is this guy, you know? So that album is what got me into, like, the love of music. And from there, I mean, you know, all through middle school and high school, you want to be, like, the people that you're influenced. So I started playing in a million different bands. Um, I got really, really lucky with a couple of them. Um, I played in a lot of pop punk bands, a uh, couple kind of, I don't want to say hip hop, but kind of alternative hip hop. Um, very like Shwayze influenced, if you know Shwayze at all. They were kind of like a little more like Hawaiian Islander. You're playing guitar? Yeah. Yeah. So production, guitar, all that stuff. Um, and then the last one that I was in was very kind of pop based, very like 1975 kind of stuff. And that was hands down the project that I was most proud of like that is a beautiful ep i think that was probably like 10 years ago give or take so i need to share that with you got cds of that or what uh (laughs) (laughs) no so it's there's some live drums mixed in there but it's very like you know digital samples as far as drums but real guitar real bass and then a lot of like heavy synth and stuff um So I've just had a journey of experimenting with different genres. I never trapped myself in anything. But what ended up being my transition to engineering was um, coming out of high school, going into college. I just knew I didn't want to work in cubicle jobs or like tech companies, anything like that. Like I just I knew I had to be creative. I didn't know what that was, but I just know I had to. And at the time was this musical industry transition of record labels kind of going under because at the time, um, what was it, Napster and Kaza or Kaza, however you pronounce it, was popping off and everyone started illegally downloading. So I'm like, okay, shit. Is this like Datpiff? Or just before that? So I want to say this was between like 2001 to 2006, 7, give or take, somewhere around there. And no one really knew anything about like what the next 10 years was going to be like streaming services were not a thing quite yet, you know? Yeah. So I'm sitting there. I'm like, okay, the whole making a full career off being an artist isn't quite the reality 
at this moment, maybe 10 years from now, whenever we figure out how to mold streaming services and everything else. But I knew I had to do something to pay the bills. And every time my band was in the studio, I found myself way more intrigued with what my engineer was doing than my own band. And I was like, light bulb moment, like that's a sign, you know? And I think a big side of that also was growing up, my parents didn't allow video games in the household. So to me, whenever I saw like the first Pro Tools or GarageBand, I'm like, ooh, this is my video game, you know? And parents couldn't really say anything because it wasn't like Call of Duty or anything. super rare too. Yeah. And, you know, they weren't like, I want to say conservative parents by any means. They were very liberal when it came to like political views or anything else. They just like, hey, if you got time for, I guess, video games, you got time to read or you got time for homework but that's or, also really dope yeah then you kind of learn or in my dad's case you got time for chores you know go mow the lawn or something you know <laughs> yeah. um so yeah um my journey was never one of those things where like kids at like five years old they know what they want to do like for the rest of their life and do everything to achieve that goal mine was definitely trial and error which i'm very thankful for because it gave me a chance to work in different bands and all those different genres, which I think ended up being my strong point transitioning to engineering. I feel like a lot of my artists really work with me now because my background isn't just straight hip hop. You know, I come from a rock background, a pop background, and especially with my vocal mixes being a lot more gritty and distorted, a lot of that comes from growing up in rock bands, you know? Um, So that's kind of where it all started. And then you know, just one slow step at a time. First little basement studio and then ended up engineering at uh, one of the biggest studios in Seattle, which was Robert Lang Studios. I did my internships there, which... How did that come I, about? Still to this day, I have no idea. That was the first place I ever recorded at. Was it really? Yeah, like... That's crazy. Well, other than my homie's closet. That's a big jump. You go from <laughs> homie's closet <laughs> yeah, to yeah, Robert Lang. Yeah, because I don't know how to... Without I had, an engineer? I had a connection. Like, one of my family members, like, knew him or something. So okay. So, like, he texted him directly and, like, got me in there for the love. Yeah. But that was, like, the first place, like, real studio I recorded. And at. that's got to be crazy inspiring because, I mean, that's where... Dave Matthews, Nirvana, yeah, Pearl I, Jam. I, the, I was walking down, you know that big staircase? It's the like, kitchen? It's like in his house. It's like right yeah. on the water. Yep. And I was walking down that staircase, that hallway. It's a long hallway all with the all these plaques on the wall. And yeah. I was like, where the fuck am I, bro? Yeah. It's the first time I've ever bro, been Bro, Robert is so a inspiring. mad scientist. Yeah. But, so yeah, I ended up doing um my internships there. Um, Met an array of amazing producers and engineers from all over the world that work on every genre of music. Uh, one of my good buddies to this day is Marcel. Um, he was a Venezuelan engineer that came up on a visa and then transferred. And now he's like the head mastering engineer at Apple down in L.A., which is beautiful to see, like major. Wow. Um, And I was taught by a couple of the guys that had a little bit to do with the Nirvana projects in the early 90s, which was really cool. You know, obviously a lot of the engineering techniques have changed because we're no longer on tape and as much analog. But just to like pick their brains on theory and how they approach things as far as EQ and compression, I mean, you can't put a price on that type of mentorship, you know? So those are the days that I will forever hold close to my heart. And then from there, you know, it was just a time for the solo journey, just like everyone does. So uh, 2010 to roughly 16 or 17. I mean, I definitely started slowing down there way before that and kind of doing my own thing. But so I want to say like day in, day out, probably five years. But the last two years were kind of a couple days a week and then down to one day a week and then once a month. And because and a, a huge part of that was over time. 90% of my clientele became vocal based. And that doesn't mean just hip hop. It could be pop or anything, but we're transitioning in the industry to where we don't need these major studios with these huge live rooms for drums and pianos and stuff with 30 microphones hooked up, you know? So it almost became overkill. You know, you can do things with a Mac computer and a preamp compressor and one microphone, you know? Yeah. So it was just yeah. a natural progression and transition that I think benefited everyone. One, it kind of forced me to start doing my solo thing. And two, it really helped the budget with the artists that I was working with to be able to put it 
towards the back end of marketing or music videos or management, anything else, you know? When you started (coughs) your own thing, uh, did you already have, like, a client base? Or was it more like, I'm just going to jump into it and then try? Dude, I was one of those guys where probably, I want to say, halfway through my career, Robert Lang, like, I was doing anything and everything. I mean... From the Facebook ads to even Craigslist, bro. Like, I was that's, doing ads on Craigslist and shit. That's what I was going to ask is, like, <clears throat> as you're at Robert Lang's, like, how did the blueprint form and mental, well, like, how did so you... So, we kind of had contracts to where we could do things on our own, but we couldn't take any clients that we got from Robert Lang out of Robert Lang, if that makes sense. So, in my head, I'm like, okay, and which works for everyone because the people that have the Lang budget are going to stay there and we're going to keep working there. And then there's smaller artists that don't have those budgets where I can can slowly build your own, like, yeah, build up my home base or whatever that might be. So as I was transitioning, you know, you see the one to two people at home and my, you know, 10 to 20 consistent clients at Lang's and then it slowly go this way, you know? And so it was just a natural progression over, you know, like I said, this is a seven or eight year period. Nothing comes overnight, but it was definitely not one of those things where like I would just build up all these clients at that studio and then decide to leave and take them. Like I had to, like I said, do the Facebook ads, the Craigslist ads, but more importantly, everything was just word of mouth. I just had, even to this day, I still do the most, beautiful souls that i work with that are kind enough to go to other artists and be like hey this is where i record whether it's with me or bailey or reed or anyone else and that's what i love about this community and you know our circle is we all hype each other up even if it has no direct benefit you know yeah absolutely. it's just sharing yeah. the love and it's all the same the I feel like goals. When, when an artist comes in they can tell you guys are like genuine you know like yeah. i've worked with probably like 10 other engineers before i came to lost (coughs) boys and it's just a complete different vibe like when you get here yeah try to keep it that way man and i think this project specifically has brought us a lot closer you know absolutely which was a huge blessing because you know the studio building the studio oh yeah yeah it broke down the wall of like engineer artists and it became to almost to where we can do this now because like sit and have conversations on life and purpose at a the old spot we're just like so gr- like just grinding and like doing our sessions and just coming in and out of the studio we're seeing each other in passing mm-hmm. here and obviously we're doing stuff outside the studio kicking it yeah. but like you know what i mean and then this building this is like it felt like ground up yeah from the ground up yeah, you know and in so, the best way yeah Shout usually ground up sounds for like a really struggle, building which it was but it was a beautiful yeah. struggle yeah. and it brought us all closer <laughs> i said shout out odre for really building it from the ground up. facts yeah, Louisiana, facts. Like and fish, Rose and, and Rose, yeah, like oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, I mean, the whole Ivory Flow game. Fish is the unsung hero on all this because he's never he on is. camera or mic. But yeah. if he does listen to this, he is. fish. Yeah, when are we gonna get Go. fish on a on a pod? Hey, pretty soon. You get eh? fish on the <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm sure bro got stories for days. Oh, I was about to say, yeah, <laughs> bro's, <laughs> for, like, bro's lived a life. Yeah, most of everybody watching don't even know who it is, but they'll get to know here pretty good. Give us a crazy story from your past, Marlo. That oh, I mean that's a broad question. Give me a. Yeah, it is a broad question. question. It is a broad I have question. A, I have a good one. Okay. Um, like kind of same thing. <clears throat> yeah. What's your craziest studio story? Like, what's the craziest thing that's ever happened in the yeah. studio? Well, honestly, like from today's standards, it's not crazy. But at the time, this was probably 2000. I want to say 13, 14. So whenever I finished the whole college thing, I was still dabbling in different internships, trying to figure out where I want to do. Because I was so stuck in that, like, mindset that is so cliche of, like, you have to go to L.A. to make it. Like, right. you know? Yep. And so, like, it's I Before had, Lang? Yeah. So okay. I put in my application to Lang's, and they said yes, which I have no idea why. Like, who would say yes to someone straight out of college type shit, you know, who had no track record whatsoever. But I was also playing around with a couple studios, um down in cali and do you guys remember the weed company uh cavi gold i they, think i do they were kind of one of the sounds f- hella familiar so they were kind of one of the first whenever everything got legalized to do really cool kind of promotional things and one of them was they would have these pre-rolled joints and they would have barcode barcodes on the joint that you scan and to bring up a song from whatever artist that that joint oh, was based off idea. of oh, it's really cool 
Um, but they built a studio down in Anaheim, and I was at the time kind of like their guide on like how to build it and all that stuff because I wasn't the best like engineer at that time, but I knew a damn lot about analog gear. I was a fucking nerd, you know. <laughs> and so I'd go down there, and we had kind of like our opening like sessions or whatever, you know. And at the time, I was I don't know twenty two, three or whatever, and all these people start coming in like people I've never even like heard of or anything like that. But they, I figured out that they were ghost writers, which I didn't know. Mm. So one of them was Chris Brown's biggest ghost writer who wrote like Hose ain't, Hose ain't loyal and shit like this. Mm. And then all of a sudden these strippers come in and they're starting to like putting up these like makeshift poles and shit. Well, I'm like starting to mix. And then I look over and there's like lines being blown off strippers asses and shit. And I'm used to like just that quick. They just start going at it. And bro, like I, I'm like, all right, let's lock in now. Yeah. Up till that point, like I'm working in like a school environment, like teachers behind me or like, you know, my, you know, my little, I guess, basement setup or whatever. So like going from that, to that, I was like, is this really what the industry is? <laughs> like, is this what selling your soul to the devil is? What studio is this? <laughs> I'm not going to say. Okay. But it was... But, it was, <laughs> yeah. but uh, a higher... A high, a, like, a nice, like a nice studio. Oh, right? no. Yeah, yeah. 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 It was yeah. multi-million, multi-million dollars. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Incredible, beautiful. Yeah. And, yeah, it was nothing, like, illegal or anything. It was just one of those things where, like, I was not used to that lifestyle. Like, I was just a young man, especially being white, you know? And then just being thrown in that culture and like it was just a normal thing. I'm like, culture shock. I guess, yeah, culture yeah. shock for sure. Yeah. And I was Dang. like, hey, I guess this is it. Let's go. <laughs> Let's send it. So you went to LA and then how long were you in LA for? For So I was just back and forth. Oh, like I was okay. not living down there because at the time my sister was living down there. So I'd go like crash with her for like a week and then she was in Orange County. So I just make the like 30 minute drive to Anaheim, do like a weekend there and then come back and. You know, yep. I was definitely taking my time Trying to figure to out what would be the best situation. And as fun as that was, that's why I ended up at Langs because I was like, I need a little more professional environment to hone in my skills before I can be around all that. Mm-hmm. You know, so, and thank God at that young age, I was aware of that. So, so what is your take on, on artists or aspiring artists mm-hmm. or aspiring engineers making the move to, to LA for? For music, what is your nowadays not needed? Yeah, I mean everything is at your fingertips. I mean yeah. these guys are a perfect example of that. I mean, yeah, whether it's yep. curating yeah. playlists or you know even searching out back end as far as management or anything else. I mean, you got to think like whether it's the '80s or '90s, all these artists would flock to LA because that's where either the movie studios or record labels were based, and they had this idea of like doing open mics or shows and hope to God that like a record label representative would be there. Right. Nowadays they're just going through your Instagram. They're going through your YouTubes. If you don't have X amount of followers or X amount of YouTube views, labels are not even going to look at you. But more importantly, we don't need that shit anymore. Like you can do everything independent. I mean, kind of the hometown hero, whatever Macklemore is the perfect example of that. I mean, the best way someone put it to me was if you think about a label and what they offer, they don't have a secret sauce. What they're good at is organizing the different point men, you know, whether it's, yeah, they just have a very streamlined process of Mm. this is your manager. This is what their role is. This is your stage manager. This is what their role is. This is your lawyer. They handle all the legal side. There's no secret sauce behind that. They just know how to organize it. So if you can, Go to UW as an independent artist and find those people. Find yourself a lawyer. Find yourself a manager. And they want to prove themselves because they're just coming out of college and, you know, pay them way cheaper than what you're going to be paying a label back, you know? That's a great idea. I think that's actually referred to as pro bono. Like, uh, yeah. there's a lot of yep. people that need internships and even free internships and that are that are, are knowledgeable, you know, like law students and – and you know like engineers and producers who are who are in school you know and um will do do a 
professional grade level work for on the low or even a lot of times free mm -hmm. but yeah what you're what you're saying is is quite true um the labels what they do is they they offer the infrastructures they they take all the resources and they bring yeah. them together into one place they're just and, banks now man but uh now you know there's a uh, you know Especially a lot with of 360 deals yeah, there's freelance sites like Fiverr and Upwork. You can hire people to yeah. do your cover art, make do it anything, lyric, yeah, lyric videos, yep. do your <clears throat> marketing, like. So yeah, yeah, it's it's right at your fingertips. You know, if you got a computer or even a smartphone, yeah. um, y everything you need is at your disposal. Yeah. Like, it's, it's the only plus I would see as far as making like the cliche like New York or Atlanta or LA move is. If you are better at networking in person, which some people are, you know, let's start yeah, people in person, are, yeah. right? Like, yeah, in full transparency, <clears throat> like to be like a real solid networker, or marketer, right? Like, you have to be like just good at talking to people, mm -hmm. right? And not a lot of people have really practiced that right like because because it's almost like yeah it's almost like you have to be a salesperson like i was gonna say that but i i don't want to limit it to like only people it who have sales is, though experience. you're selling yourself but exactly like yeah. if the product is the music right then you need to have some degree of experience and not only the music anymore it. you yourself yeah, is you a are that you are yeah the brand. i mean if yeah, you look at like diddy with what is it ciroc vodka and you yeah. know it's not just music anymore yeah, you know Elliot, you are your own brand yeah, yeah. absolutely and you're, you too like you got your fashion and everything else. yeah yeah you know? right and uh and so that's what i think i think you know you you make a very good point you can do everything virtually that a label could do for you by yourself yeah um mm -hmm. and then i think the other downside of of going to la or atlanta or new york is you know you're you're jumping into a much bigger you're jumping into the ocean right yeah, saturated like it's one it's of so a billion oversaturated dense. exactly it's so <laughs> yep. oversaturated because yeah. everybody is thinking that same thing you know i'll move yeah. to la and i'll get big like you said they've been doing it since the 70s yeah like you know that's 50 years <laughs> <laughs> yeah of right. people doing that exact same thing yeah whereas same you know out here not many people are like oh i'm gonna move to seattle and make it big right yeah um but that that doesn't mean that That's there's not something that. special. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Single exactly, person. You know? yeah. yeah, it's all supply and demand, right? Um, I do know two people actually that say that. Really? Real shit? Yeah, uh, YC Calico. Okay. You okay. know him. You, yeah. yeah. So yep. they were from, uh, and his buddy Third. So they're from Mississippi. And they moved up here, I want to say, three or four years ago. Uh. And I don't know how they found me or the Seattle Lost Boys. But that was like one of the first questions. I was like, why do you guys move to Seattle? And usually like the cliche answer is like either Microsoft, Amazon or Boeing. Right. You know, it's like the job. And but no, or air both quality. of them were like music. Like we just saw <laughs> some shit popping off up here and yeah. they're still here four years later. And it's so. because it's a gem, right? Like, yeah. like it's really Seattle really is a diamond in the rough. Right. Um, just a lot of things require faith. Right. And and if you really have faith in yourself as an artist, then you wouldn't really look like look towards <clears throat> Los Angeles like oh I would you know this is the missing link right yeah. because it's 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 really not everything can be done out here we have so much talent in our area right that if we just come together we'll be able to do something yeah. special we'll make an impact right yeah. what what do you what do you think are down the clicks yeah yeah absolutely what do you think are a couple of things that define Seattle whether people or or we sound have, or genre. We have a sound that is undeniable. And that sound started even way before any of us were involved in this. I mean, some people that were close to that I really think stapled this. I mean, as far as like, I want to say mid 2000s to current. I mean, you know, homies like Sam LaChow. He's a sure. perfect example. Like, bro's been doing this a minute. And when you hear a Sam track, like, you know, like, that's Seattle. And that's. You've I worked mean, with Sam, right? What's that? You've worked with Sam. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's that whole camp. I mean, Gifted Gab, right. uh, Jarv D, uh, uh, Raz Simone. Yeah, Raz Simone, um, Dave B. Yeah, Dave B. And yeah. there, it's hip-hop, absolutely, but our, there's something about us that... And a part of it is almost like the live instrument part. Sure. Like, I don't know why, yeah. but for some reason, yeah. Seattle hip hop has a lot of horns. <laughs> I don't know yeah. if you guys have noticed <laughs> yeah, that, but like, yeah. we have yeah. a lot of horns in our shit. Like the Macklemore and the. Yeah, like, well, even like the early Sam stuff and all that. But yeah. so there, there's something about it that's hip hop, but it's different compared to like Atlanta trap or 
um, New York Drill or Chicago or, you know, yeah. like, and I'm not a music theorist, so I can't pinpoint exactly what it is. I just know my ear when it hears something like even if I wasn't from Seattle, I would know that's got the Seattle tone to it. Um, but beyond just the music, um, I think what separates us is we came out of a genre that was known as grunge, you know, like our claim to and yeah, our claim to fame was the nineties with Pearl Jam and Temple of the Dog. Yep, Nirvana, yeah. all yeah. those, Kurt Cobain. And we had such like a I don't want to say a dead space, but like nothing really caught much attention until Thrift Shop, like two thousand what, ten think so? or something. Yeah. I mean there was I mean, little yeah. things, but nothing on that scale. major. Yeah, nothing yeah. on that yeah, scale, yeah. you know? Yeah. And I, some people viewed that as like, you know, Seattle don't got anything going on up there or whatever. And I know all of us in this room have always viewed that as like, that gives us a chance to mold something that hasn't been done before. Yeah, hundred percent. Instead of, cause you look at other cities and no disrespect whatsoever, but like there's so many artists and cities that they want to imitate what Atlanta did because Atlanta's fucking popping. I mean, everything yeah. from like the early two thousands that was Usher and, all that up until now the influence which is, of ev from everywhere yeah, yeah. and yeah. i love it i respect the hell out of it i mean they were a city that up until that point i mean they had some recognition but nothing on the level they're on now you know and they really created an infrastructure of themselves where they didn't have to rely on la or anything else right. they made their own labels they made their own studios their management teams their pr companies you know yeah. and Instead of trying to imitate that, like, I'm just trying to view all this as, like, we can all be the ones to create that in our own Seattle way. Like, if absolutely. we just have a blank canvas, now let's get some paintbrushes and start yeah, painting, absolutely. you know? Yeah. yeah. Truth is. It's exciting. The, the paint is starting to. Starting to yeah. Paint, you know? People just don't know it yet. Yeah, There's so much going on behind the scenes. Yeah. Let's, yeah. yeah. let's be real. Yeah. Shoot. So, but, like, to go yeah. back to the Lost Boys thing really quick. Like, okay. We you you left Robert Lang, and so how long has Lost Boys been around? You went directly to the Rainier Building, leaving. Yeah. Yeah. So, so well, not directly. Like I said, I was still dabbling at Lang's up until like 2016, 17. I made the Lost Boys LLC in 2014, so there was like mm. a three-year kind of transitioning period. So it wasn't like one day I left and the next day I was signing leases and shit. Um. Because the biggest thing, honestly, was I just wanted tier one gear. And that's not cheap, you know, yeah. especially for a 25-year-old, you know. So, like, I knew what I wanted, especially coming from Langs, who does have the top tier gear. You know, you're working on Sony C800Gs, uh, SSL board, 48 channels. I mean, you're talking nothing is cheap, you know. Right. And I knew, like, if I wanted to make a staple, especially for me being an introvert, like, I'm not a huge extrovert loud person that puts himself out there i wanted my staple or thumbprint to be quality and that comes with a price tag so that came with buying one small piece of gear at a time you know it's not like i went to guitar center and bought everything at once like i'd buy one wow. mic yeah. 12 months later i'd buy a knee preamp another year later i'd buy the tube tech compressor you know and so that was a long long period because yes you what's the first piece yeah. of gear you got because i mean reed Really didn't come into play until 2019. I think that's oh, yeah. when I like I met him once before through Trev, but we weren't really like close by any means until he made the move up here from. Uh, I think he was going to school in Cali for baseball or something until 2019. So, yeah, so it was just me doing solo dolo for years there. How'd you meet Trev? What was. There was someone else that I was working with that was friends with Trev, because if you know Trev, you know he's friends with everyone in the most random ways. Yeah. So it was just one of those <laughs> words of mouth things, because he was still living over on the, the peninsula at the time. He was still in PA. Oh, shit. And bro would hit me like a month prior and book a session. and then He take, said he would take the ferry. Yeah, and take then, the ferry out for yeah. the day, Damn. have the session, take the ferry back. And I'm like, you just need to move out here, bro. Like. That is a long ass trip for a session, but respect for the dedication, you know. So he ended up making the move. 
and then that's how that whole circle kind of got formed. I think he got his first place in, um, I, I think it was Shoreline actually. And then Reed was playing baseball at the time and tore his shoulder. So he was couch surfing at Trev's and then we all just started becoming friends and you know, one thing leads to another. So yeah. Wow. Man. It's one of those things where like you never search for people to be your homies. They just fall in your lap. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. When you connect with someone, you connect, and you know here it's we are. It's weird how things align later. like that, and then What's it that? starts. It's weird how things align like that. Yeah, and then that relationship there actually started to define Lost Boys as a whole, and then yeah. you know in its own way, and like bring a new light to it, and then yeah, the artists that come in wouldn't maybe never even been here for that, and then it's just mm -hmm. crazy like the chain reaction. Yeah, you know, Reed like, <clears throat> really brought a whole new perspective on how i approach studios as well because he's montana boy born and raised country you know um so very conservative and which is opposite of everything seattle which i don't know how to really explain it but it helped me find a middle ground with a lot of people that i work with that might not have the same seattle mindset and that doesn't mean just coming from like country backgrounds or anything but having a closer relationship with him who's such a polar opposite personality than me really help break down my walls as an introvert and be more open with different artists that come from different backgrounds or different personalities. So, and that was the first time where I was like, okay, this needs to not be just me. Like I can see this being a bigger thing than just me. And that's where we're at now. Like I'm at the point where I want this whole thing to be passed on to, you know, youngins that are far smarter and talented than me. And I can, Keep Went working that. with these guys on creating more of an <clears throat> infrastructure for engineers and producers. And at some point, you know, I will hang up the hat on engineering and take my tactical skills to Africa and save the <laughs> cheetahs. <laughs> yeah. Laugh at that real life. <laughs> I know it's wow. real life. So <laughs> what, what, what's like the the daily life of Milo? Like run me through a Ooh. run me through your daily routine. That's what I love about this job. There is no like normal thing yeah no, yeah you can do whatever yeah. the fuck you want yeah bro. literally we make yeah. our own schedule and it's it, okay describe your ideal normal, okay. describe your so, ideal day then uh okay so wake up um first things first is meditation or yoga you got to get the mind right and that i feel like sets the pace for the whole day you set your intentions you set your goals just having that like 30 minutes to an hour of no phone calls, no emails, no people hovering over your shoulders or anything. Just you being intentional about what you want out of the day. Like, and that's been a long, long practice for me to hone in and perfect. And I still don't think I have that down. But, you know, I really found a lot of benefits out of that. And I say that because I see a lot of youngins wake right up, jump to the shower, get their coffee, go straight to work, and their day's a clusterfuck, and they don't know why. I'm telling you why. It's because you start your day as a clusterfuck, you know? Yeah. Um. So that's really important for me is just taking that first hour of the day and, you know, give gratitude for everything you have, the people in your life, setting intentions. Uh, from there, um, I have a five-year-old African serval, which is pretty much a child. He requires a lot of love and a lot of attention, a lot of care. So we go to the park, we do our thing, we chase bunnies, uh, come back, go to the gym. Um, you know, got to reach those 10,000 steps a day. Keep the heart healthy, especially yeah, so for our lifestyle. <laughs> yeah. um, and then depending on what the studio schedule is, whether it's taking calls with these guys or emails from potential artists or setting up schedules with Reed and Bailey and Jorgen and the rest of the team. Um, and then mainly just checking in with my artists all day on what mix edits they need, um, what mastering deadlines we need, and then coming home, making dinner, meal prepping for the next day. Um, reading is a big thing at the end of the day for me um i have really bad like sleep problems <laughs> as most of people in this generation do so i found this routine of making sure like all outside noise is turned off at least like two hours before bed so no tv no podcast um no phone absolutely no phone and then just slowly winding down on like an hour of reading and then you know go to bed and I put on like little stream noises or something like that and curb out. Something like this, some like a little 
fire crackle or yeah, a little exactly. waterfall or something. Also, I know you be, you be really shooting guns a lot. So how how often yes. do you go hit the range and? Well, it depends. Or so wherever you shoot your guns. Yeah. At. So weekends, <laughs> <laughs> weekends oh, yeah, are range pretty range dedicated <laughs> to two <laughs> things, and that's summertime is trying to be outside as much as possible. I mean, especially living in Washington State, we only have like four months. Well, now it seems longer. The last yeah. couple of years, for some reason, yeah. I don't know if the world's ending or what, yeah. but we've like I feel like our summers are like going into October now. It's weird. Yeah. Um, not complaining. But yeah, so sick. weekends is either try to do hikes and shit or the running and gunning thing, which is what I know you're super keen running and about. I am, bro. Yeah, so I know you're on way you, 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 yeah. I know you're on <laughs> your tactical shit. Like you, yeah. Like, have you gone through like and uh, done like you go through the house and hit the dummies and shit and like play the? So I grew up completely surrounded by whether it's military or law enforcement so it's always been around me and always been a major passion but music obviously took over um so i grew up actually wanted to go into special forces when i was middle school high school my first movie that i remember was my dad taking me to saving private ryan i don't know if you guys saw that tom yeah, hanks movie that, uh, like 98 Goated. 99 classic yeah and yeah. i was like that's what i'm gonna do and then two things happened so after 9-11 happened, I 100% wanted to go in, just like every other, you know, male at that time wanted to go fight for their country. And then by the time I graduated high school, we found out that there was no WMDs in Iraq, which was our reason for invading. I don't know if you guys know history like that, but our whole reason for invading Iraq was we were told from the Bush administration that they had weapons of mass destruction. And over the course of three years, they found none. And we figured out that these wars are over oil and everything else. So Don't make like, me get into some 9-11 conspiracy. Yeah, we'll bro. go. That's going to be another podcast. <laughs> we'll go there. Don't, bro, I'm, I'm going to get you on that rabbit hole for hours. Um, <laughs> so not only that, but um, whenever I graduated, I was also diagnosed with Crohn's disease. And a huge factor for all military is you can't have Crohn's disease. So that was no longer an option for me. Music took over. But that side of things has always been a major passion and love for me and that's not only just tactical but historical like i'm a huge world war ii nerd like if you catch me like reading them come home at you know 10 o'clock at night and i'll be watching like weird world war ii documentaries and stuff it just fascinates me human nature in general fascinates me war in general fascinates me why we have wars and that grew into the passion of tactical training which is um cqb which is close quarter combat if you guys don't know um so that really really progressed in the early 2000s in afghanistan with special forces so in conventional warfare we had to go on battlefields in terrorist warfare there was none of that you know you have to go in house by house clearing them making sure there's no terrorists in there so these new developments came and just being around those people my whole life i just slowly grew a love and passion for those tactics and almost became a therapy for me hope to god i never have to use any of it but nowadays especially in 2024 with all the shit going on in ukraine and fucking israel everything else i mean if you really go down into the research like especially with power grids china makes all that software bro like china the flip of a switch could shut off all of our power grids how many of you do you think are, could survive more than two or three days without power, honestly? For real. Like, I'm just this country in general. Can we yeah. use a generator? I, how many of the people we know have generators at home? There would be anarchy yeah. within three sick. days, hands down. Yeah. We, we can't so, record. What's that? We wouldn't be able to record. <laughs> yeah, that'd be, like, be the worst. Fuck this shit, bro. Yeah. <laughs> anarchy. And not getting, like, out. dark or heavy, but, like, these are skills that I be truly believe that no one ever has to use but you should know and that's not yeah. only just running nice. a gun and tactical learning how to clear houses work on two-man teams or eight-man stacks i'm talking about just like survival like yeah do you know how to boil water so there's no pesticides in it type yeah. shit you know yeah. like that got lost in this generation somehow and i just want to be a part of the small solution to fix that and bring those bare basics of survival back to that's families yeah. i feel like i learned yeah. some of that shit watching naked and afraid low-key Never seen it, but <laughs> yeah. I believe you. I'm Wait, like, all right, yeah. if I get in the woods, 
I'm gonna do that. You like history? Have you seen Oppenheimer? Yes, I actually just watched it two nights ago. Poor guy got fucked over. Cra- yeah, crazy. S- screwed over. Yeah. You guys seen it? Such a good movie. I though. haven't. I haven't. I haven't seen it. So it's it, yeah. the it's the you, you you designed the atomic bomb. Yeah. So well he guy he designed. took what Einstein did as far as splitting the atom and built off of that for yeah. Einstein's yeah. in the movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty sick. For yeah. So everyone wants to blame him for Japan and stuff, but you know it's a crazy he story. He didn't drop it. He just invented it. So. Um, but yeah, great movie. Do you have like a favorite artist that you've worked with then over? Like a favorite, Ooh. like what was your first big artist that came along that you were like super first stoked big on? One? Um, the guys from Death Cab for Cutie. So I was doing my internships, uh, Robert Lang, and they came down. They were doing something for a soundtrack. I forget what movie it was, but like I said, I grew up in kind of like the emo pop punk type shit, and mm-hmm. they were kind of out of that phase at that time. But the inner like fanboy of me, and I don't get like <laughs> nervous around like anyone you know i mean i could be around fucking tom cruise and be like chill as fuck but for some reason whenever it's bands that i grew up on that really impacted me i'm like fanboy still you know so uh yeah so yeah just meeting them and having a very very small role like i was yeah. still like not even assistant engineer i was intern engineer you know so i was like running getting them coffee and shit you know but just being able to be in the same room around them and not just see like YouTube videos, but be a firsthand witness of how they not only work together, but clash in a positive way, like having polar opposite ideas and hating yep. each other's ideas, but finding that middle ground. That was a huge light bulb for me as far as like, this really is a team thing, you know, like even though bands like that have their, I think his name is Ben, if I remember right. Um, they have their main like songwriter and singer that everyone knows but when they're in the studio it really is like a team band thing you know like even yeah. coming down to like i want this kick drum here take out that kick drum and it's not even the drummer saying that it's like the bass player or guitar player or something you know yeah so that was that was a really cool experience for me wow so shout out death cab wow mm-hmm. that's crazy we should even do like a you know be dope like what's like the tiny desk you know what i'm talking about yeah the tiny desk concert, the npr concert? NPR yeah, yeah, yeah. Series. It'd be yeah. cool to even. I mean, now we're doing the podcast. Yeah. Set up and take it to another level and do like a live. Was the dude I was talking about down in uh, Anaheim, Chris Brown's ghostwriter. Oh, okay, he's one like, of them. He, I've never seen anyone be able to change their voice on a fly like that. So he wrote within like a four hour session, and I have no idea if these songs went anywhere because they just write songs and then they end up selling them to whoever, you know? Could, so be, any, could be anywhere. Yeah, and they could end up yeah. changing the lyrics or whatever. Yeah. And Praying is a perfect example of that. Like I saw uh, videos of this in the studio of when we were doing the demos and it was a dude singing it. Like Kesha didn't even own the song at that time, you know? Um, but this dude, That's crazy. I forget his name. It's going to kill me. Remind me to look it up whenever we're done. But we went from doing a Chris Brown demo to the next one being a Justin Bieber demo, to the next one being like a Selena Gomez or something. And he would literally sing in falsetto so high to where it would sound like a female singing. Wow. And then, you know, the next one we would do would be like a Chris Brown one and be like baritone. And that's what he lives for is doing that. Yeah. Like, and that's bro pulled thing. up in like his Lambo and everything. I'm like, why aren't you? And he's good looking. Like he has the whole package. So I actually asked him like, <laughs> why aren't you like an artist? He's like, I couldn't deal with fame, bro. Like I... I'm in the perfect spot. Like I express what I need to express and I get the paycheck and I don't got to deal with yeah. the pressure of being known. I'm like nailed it. Smart guy. So there's a yeah. lot of, so there's a lot of money in the music industry and songwriting. Oh, bro's, ghost so writing. bro's making checks. He's making okay. more than the artist that buys it. Cause he gets royalties, not only selling it, but he's getting the royalties off of the label that now owns it. Plus royalties. If it ends up being played on commercials yeah. or <clears throat> NFL or, you know, whatever. So he's probably getting three or four different incomes off one song. Wow. So by the end of it, like he's easily 50% where the other 50% is split between the artist, the label, the lawyer, the. And he's with the service. label, right? So he's with the label? No, he's independent. Oh, he's, he's independent. A straight ghostwriter, yeah. And oh, that's why oh. I hear a lot of these ghostwriters that are coming up from Seattle and they're like signed specifically to certain things. And I don't know, like if they have management just steering in wrong directions or if that's the only way they knew to get their foot in the door. But Hmm. I knew him before I met any of them. So I'm like, you don't have to be exclusive to 
a certain label or artist. Like you can be an independent ghostwriter just like you can be independent, independent. artist, yeah. you know? Yep. Right. So he can jump around from Universal <clears throat> to Sony to, you know, whoever. And that's the way to do it. Wow. Then you're not tied down and you can write for whoever and whatever, yeah, you know? It's crazy how many, like, like we were talking about before with the labels, how many, like, different <coughs> roles there actually are. In a in within a within how a many what like role like roles like oh yeah different positions that are played absolutely like when a like when a major label artist comes into a studio and they have so many maybe not there when they're recording maybe they want their 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 privacy when they're recording but coming into making this the the record yeah like dude I see so many songs that come out now from a major label that mm. it's like t- I mean I mean before too I mean really any time but like ten producers. Three mm-hmm. song, three songwriters, and then two engineers and a, ma- a matching engineer with yeah. two assistant matching engineers. There was this huge yeah. article that came out in I want to say it was 2015. Um, Rihanna's what was that huge one she had? The work, 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 work. There was another oh. song <laughs> on that that was major. It was the that's the that's the anti album. Uh, yeah, well, that Some album is so fire. Bro. Fire. Yeah. But umbrella. This, umbrella. This whole, he, like remade umbrella? That Tame Impala What's that? Song. Umbrella. No, it was on the Ant album. It was oh. uh, was it that the tame? In the carriage? Oh I shit! Know. I'd forget it. But anyway, there was this huge article on it, and whoever wrote it did an amazing job. And he broke down everything that went into play before she even was on the song. And there was close to like five million dollars spent on wow. pre-production between. So what they did was they rented out like all of Hit Factory. And if you know anything about Hit Factory, it's like ten different studios in one. Each room is like over a thousand a day so you're looking at like (laughs) minimum say 10 to 20 grand just on the studio okay then they're hiring multiple ghost writers to start just busting out song ideas brainstorm different engineers different producers and so they went into all this and then once they get a demo of that song that they liked that potentially might make the album with a ghost writer artist so still not rihanna then they would put it in listening rooms and have just average people like fans like give feedback and they got to pay each one of those people to like give their feedback on it and then they would actually go back from the demo reproduce the beat blah 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 and then they'll go back and be like okay if we get rihanna on this what's the potential that it could sell like a year from now 10 years from now like they're looking at longevity so i'm gonna be off by the numbers a little bit but it was a stupid amount that was invested into these songs before she's even singing on them that's like some mastermind stuff. Oh, it is. Stuff. That's what I'm saying. Like, that type of artist, like, they are artists. Like, she is an incredible performer, incredible singer. But it is, what is, uh, what do they call it? Like, a label placement or whatever they call it? Oh, like an industry plan. An industry plan. Yeah, 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 exactly, you know? Yeah. And not saying she started that way, because I know her history started, was it Barbosa or somewhere? Barbados. Barbados, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, obviously, but... Yeah, once you get to that level where there's that much invested before you're even in the studio singing on it, like that's each song and then yeah, making an album. Yeah, that's crazy to me. Crazy to me. And for and, me, being an engineer, like working with you guys in such a close knit circle and environment, that doesn't even sound fun. Yeah, that sounds. <laughs> you know? Yeah, that sounds kind of stressful. Like, actually. That's what I'm saying. Like that at that point, like I just go work for fucking Microsoft I wonder if <laughs> I wonder how early on in like this process of them producing the record did Rihanna actually hear the, the even the instrumental yeah oh, I'm did sure she not... she's involved at some point like yeah for it, sure but, you know but I just imagine like them like creating this and like she's just it's just weird like it's just so weird like that she would come in later and I don't know it yeah. just it's just crazy process whenever like, we wrap up I'll bring it up for you it's really yeah. insightful it's really cool it's weird that um that's that's a thing is is doing that Mm-hmm. And then there's like artists like um like when the SoundCloud era started booming yeah. that just closet songs, but bedroom that's what songs. I'm about what that, we're all doing. Like yeah. We're proving we don't need that. Yeah. Like long as you just have good intentions with good music, people will catch on. Yep. I, I came along with the internet. Where do you where do you think we are now? Like in terms of you know, like all right, we're we're here in Seattle. The last thing to really pop as far as like hip hop goes would be like Macklemore really, Lil Mosey, Travis Thompson. Yeah. There's it seems like there's an immense amount of talent, but there also seems like there's this kind of wave 
building it, from from my perspective i guess but where do you where do you see things going in the next year to three years as far as talent and um i guess being recognized for for what the works we're doing out here I think you've nailed it multiple times. Like the talent isn't a question. We're not lacking on that. We just what you look at other cities that they have that they've perfected is literally being able to cross that bridge from the artist to the listener's ear. And that's the only thing we're lacking right now. Like we have the technology to get it, but we're just lacking on the infrastructure to get those listeners to click that link. Like, yeah. and that's, you know, that's shit that's beyond my head because I'm an engineer. I am not educated enough to speak on the back end algorithms and all that. I just know that's the one thing we are lacking because uh, the most talented yeah. artists that I work with here, some of them still don't have a clue as far as like who they need to hire, or bring on their team or management or A&R or stuff. And I'm like, yeah, you've been doing this X amount of years. You have sold out shows anytime you post a show like no question that shit's going to sell out yeah. but when, it's a struggle to understand like how to bring that to that level you know and i don't have the answer because that's not my role but i just know yeah. that's what's missing you know and that's what we're all here to solve and yeah. i think we're well on our way and like and like from an from an artist's mind like i hear so many artists say uh oh i, I need a manager because they know they're they know they're talented. They know that they you know, have. You know, Danza always says is managers find you, but you don't find a manager. And I think there's some truth yeah. to that. Yeah. 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 I think that yeah. there's truth to that, and I feel like that's happening amongst uh, you know our, our our circle and our community. I I I also think that you're exactly right as far as the talent goes. It seems to be that there's an immense amount of talent, and what seems to be lacking is the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Not just is there an immense amount of talent, but there's an immense amount of resources. You know, being able mm -hmm. to come to Lost Boys, like, indeniably. And community. It, we have a really know, good community that's very supportive. We, we which is amazing, yeah. We do. Yeah, man, look at our sports, like, the 12th man and the Sounders mm -hmm. and the shows. Like, our fans, Seattle yeah. fans are die hard. Like, everybody yeah. knows that. Yeah, so so we, we really have a supportive community. What you guys have done at Lost Boys is in, indeniably great. Like, uh, it, it, the demos we leave with, you know, I know it frustrates you guys, but, like, artists just want to drop those. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, be, be, so true. Because, you know, like like you say, you know, ha ha having having the gear, you know, you know, being able to record on the Sony uh, and being able to... to, to, to 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 have <clears throat> the analog gear, you know, the Neve and the 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 CL one B and yeah. be, being able to 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 have the tools, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and the not to mention the price. Like I don't know if <clears throat> the people watching know, yeah. but when you go to L A or Atlanta or uh, Miami or New York, the same gear costs one fifty two hundred dollars an hour to record on and you you guys are literally less than half of that price yeah. and so it, it it makes it more accessible to the, to the artist to be able to leave here with a quality product that 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 is is you know because we're just one we're just a part of it. i say we because i'm an artist myself but we record you know but without the engineer and without the 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 production you know and the the mastering and, and and everything that you guys do it it's it, it will just fall flat it would fall short you know i yeah. can record it on garage band at home but you know no matter how talented i am yeah. um, it's not gonna sell with without the 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 reps that you've put in so the so the resource, i like that the reps the reps you know so the, true the resources are <clears throat> here you know, the talent is here, not just the talent and the artists, but the, the resources is, and the photographers and directors and engineers and marketing and A&R. But the infrastructure that brings them all together has been lacking. So yeah. uh, truthfully, um, that's that's what we want to do at Ivory Flow. Uh, Phil and I, we've been working on this for two or three years now. And what we realized was that exactly like we would leave the studio with our product and we're like, okay, well like now what? And mm -hmm. then we realized like, Oh shoot. Like we're not the only ones wondering that, you know, all the other <laughs> the <artists> whole town <laughs> are, are as well. So like, um, you know, and then when <clears throat> we're building this business idea, we're like, well, 
when you when you have a great business idea you need to be able to address a problem and what's the biggest problem that artists are having it's like they want to be independent like it's like a freelance type of world like people don't want to sign to labels so like you know if yeah. if we're going to help you know like a label would help and create infrastructure like how could we also address the problem of letting the artist still be independent so yeah. we decided to form a nonprofit um and 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 do that exactly so you know it was a blessing like our first project that we were able to help the community actually turned out to be the studio build where we were able to our goal is artist development so this was an opportunity to play a small part in in that and um to to be able to uh in a, in a moment's notice of time come in and put our efforts in and in our mission to create a pathway for the artists has been great. So now moving forward, like outside of just having this space, are, are, are we planning to start workshops where we where we teach the artists and about the resources that are available to them, tell them how to get to those resources from, from grants at the Seattle Foundation, you know, that are for individual artists and they can get up to $3,000 a year as an individual without even an LLC, just as an individual, you know, and they, they can fund their, their projects or a show or, or whatnot, mm -hmm. you know yeah. what I mean? But it, the, just the, that helping hand. Yeah, the, the, a helping that we hand. we all need. Yeah, delivering the seat. information, you know. So, <clears throat> um, and, and, and as that happens, you know, as they do have the information, they can take that step forward because in a moment they might not know how to step, you know, outside of creating the product. We got the product, you know, but, like, how am I going to shoot a music video? Well, you know, maybe I can't afford it, but, hey, check out this grant opportunity. Now you can afford it, you know, and then... How, how am I going to do A&R and marketing? Well, we'll check, you know. So our, our goal is just to to take all the resources, take all the talent, and create infrastructure, create order mm -hmm. of operation, create procedures that can uh, uh, provide sustainability. You know, you don't have to and be... And educating them. Yeah, educating. You don't have to be an artist <clears throat> making millions, you know. You don't have to be a Drake or a Future. You know, you can do shows and you can be a local artist and make six figures, you know, $100,000 a year plus and, and live a sustainable lifestyle without being huge, you know. Mm -hmm. But you need to... You it's your own definition yeah. of success. Yeah, it's your what own makes you happy, yeah. Exactly, <clears throat> yep. so... We we want to we want to teach that and show people more money that, means more taxes. Yeah. <laughs> Shoot, man. <laughs> true, yeah, true. Yes, yes, and no. You know, there's facts. There's uh, loopholes. <laughs> yeah, they call them They're tax. They're not loopholes. They're tax and You know what I mean? Yeah, I know. I just fuck it around. But yeah, n no, it, it it's all love. I, I asked that mm. question as far as like, what does the next one to three years look like? Because I think that we all know that there's this storm of talent <clears throat> brewing yeah. and we also know what's been missing and the the truth is th the ball is rolling the wheels are turning and we are looking to to change that you yeah. know like the change and i don't think it's going to end with us i think we're just going to be the spark Catalyst. and it's gonna yeah yeah i think once we at least get the foundation and show people that can be done. It's going to inspire others, and that's what we're here to do, you know? Yeah, absolutely. 100%. We can't handle a town by ourselves, you know? So <laughs> if we can inspire others and just finally level up all together, that's what we're after. Yeah, True. absolutely. And I think that's a great transition to episode two. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> In closing. The last thing I do want to say, though, speaking on what we were earlier, is I don't want any aspiring engineers to think that you need expensive gear to make great music. You don't. You just need passion and love, but nice gear does help. Yo. <laughs> wow. That was put perfectly. Nice, nice that was put perfectly. Is there going to be, real quick, is there going to be opportunities for engineers that are currently in school now, <laughs> like you were and then you interned at Robert Lang? Do you mm -hmm. plan to have interns come on or is it probably not interns on like a i guess daily basis like i was doing but i really want to focus on the workshops with ivory flow i think and why i say that is because it's a lot more tailored that way um the internships that i'm used to is 
how do I put it? You, you're in sessions that are business sessions. Okay. So a lot of the times you just have to be a fly on the wall and hope to God that you soak in the knowledge. Cause if you're bugging the engineer on like, why'd you do that while he's trying to work with the artist or something like it's just, it's not, a it's win for anyone, you know, where if we do like a little more low key, you know, workshop classes where we can actually focus and take questions and, you know, put effort and time into answering those questions properly. I feel yep. like it's more of a win win for everyone because it's a lot less stress on us engineers who are trying to teach. You don't have an artist that is annoyed that you have an intern like asking you <laughs> who you're paying questions and shit. And they're paying a paying customer or yeah, paying and, and as opposed to in. like when you're in sessions and shit, when you're focused on like one song with workshops, like we can bounce around depending on what the students want. You know, if you want to yeah. work on a rock song this hour, next hour, do something hip hop or pop, right. you can do that. You know, so and that's just from my personal experience. And yeah. I just want to try that, you know, if down the line, I do feel like there'd be a bonus to like having a more intimate of like bringing in one or two interns on a consistent basis, you know, great. But from my experience on all the internships that I did, like starting out as coffee boy and then working your way up and just being a fly on the wall, like it really sucked having so many questions and not being able to ask because they are being paid by the artist and you yeah. are, you know. So that's where I'm at with that. Yeah. But we never know. Yeah. We'll see you a year from now. Right on, man. Yep. <laughs> hey, thank you for your time. Yeah. My pleasure, uh, guys. 100%. Thank, thank you for what you've done for the community here and the, the pathways you paved for the artists and the engineers. Um, really looking forward to see what we do in the years to come. Thank you, guys. I love you all so much. Yeah, love. You Appreciate love you, you guys. Really love, man. Yep. Biggest Cut. Yes. Episode two on the way. Okay. <laughs> nice.